We've been pretty negative on China now for uh, for better part of 13 years. And uh, I think that the, the risks that China poses have, have morphed from purely financial uh, to, to now uh, beyond that into the political realm and the national security realm. And I, and I think that's that makes this a bigger story. Um, and, and the economic model risks as to how China sort of uh, deals with those may in fact affect the politics. And, and yeah, does, does the contagion spread uh, beyond what I think most people are expecting at this point? The good news is is that the, the, the risks to the real estate market and the economic model do not have a lot of direct contagion risk to Western banks and particularly American banks. Um, where the risks are are in uh, our equity and debt investments um, that, that you know, various funds hold, pension funds hold, uh, retail investors hold. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's the bigger issue as opposed to a, a 2008 type transmission mm. from their real estate bubble bursting to everyone's real estate bubble bursting. They can, they can keep that internal, but it's a big problem. What are the threats beyond an ec- economic collapse or a property collapse in China? I'm talking geopolitical threats, national security threats. Yeah. What's the stuff that keeps you up at night? Well, the, the morphing from spending on the additional high-speed rail link that's unprofitable or the next apartment building and putting up and basically building another aircraft carrier. Mm. You know, the classic 1930s scenario where, where, where a number of, of countries, you know, ramped up their defense spending as a way to stimulate, um, and we know how that ended. And so I think that, that it, we, we saw reports even today, I mentioned it earlier, that uh, Chinese defense spending may be a lot greater than we think, um, you know, as high as 4% of GDP. The U.S. is 3% of GDP. Um, so they are spending more money. Um, it used to be directed internally with, with internal security systems mm. and, and that, but increasingly now it, it's hard to miss that, that it's also external with the Blue Water Navy and, uh, and increased uh, tensions around Taiwan. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, how much of a, a concern do you think that is right now, a, a, an invasion of Taiwan? Um, well, as I said uh, earlier, I think the real risk is something something happens, right? An incident mm-hmm. that's, that's unexpected, right? You have now ships transversing, crossing each other's bows. You have uh, you know, a lot of aircraft in the area. And all we need is someone, you know, a pilot to make a mistake or, or, or get scared or... or, or uh, you know, a mishap of somewhat, and then you have an you have an international incident, and and that's I think as the temperature kind of rises in the in the South China Sea, I think that's the real risk um, as opposed to a premeditated, you know, attack on a Western country or Western ally. So you want to short China potentially? <laughs> well, how, we've how been do you short position? we've been short China for for years. I uh, you know, paradoxically, we're less short China now than we were. 10, 12 years ago, um, because China has gone nowhere. I mean, the stock market has has basically been flat for 12 years. And uh, as every other stock market uh, has has tripled or quadrupled. So it's been a very poor place for Western investors to park their money for years, not just for the last 12 years, but really for the last 20 years. And uh, I think that's going to continue to be the case, broadly speaking. China does not treat Western capital very well. How are you betting against China right now? We have uh, we have some direct shorts in the financial area. Uh, we have some indirect shorts um, that that depend on China uh, for a, a fair amount of their their revenues. Um, but as I said, our direct shorts are are probably no more than four or five six percent of our portfolio. Uh, in two thousand and ten and eleven, it was above twenty percent. We've spent a lot of time over the past few months talking about the struggles of the Chinese economy and the data that we get, or the lack thereof, of data that we get, Jim. What evidence do you have that the Chinese economy is actually worse than what Beijing says or, or what markets already believe? Yeah, the funny thing is, is, is that if you have an investment-driven economic model, which they do, the GDP is actually accurate. Um, I, I noticed something over the weekend that Michael Pettis pointed out, that in an investment-driven model, GDP growth is actually an input. It's not the residual, which I think is a really interesting observation. That is, I, I've always joked that China's 
the only major developed economy that knows its annual GDP on January 1 of that year. <laughs> I saw that in your Yeah, yeah and, 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 and so you know, whatever the numbers needs to be, they will put enough stimulus in terms of new investment to hit that number, give or take. So I, I don't I don't quibble with the with the, the actual numbers they're putting out, but it's the quality of the numbers, if you will. That 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 if you never write off bad investments, the the actual costs to GDP are sitting in your banking system in terms of bad debts. And you have to either inflate that away or recapitalize your banking system. And so that's the nexus of this economic model with with economic growth um, and and it's a banking issue ultimately and so I think that that that's where I, I worry that as long as the banks never write off the bad debts that's where the quality if you will of, of disclosure is poor let's shift gears just slightly one our last minute here before the break you're sticking with us um, the arm IPO was today shares rallied 24 uh, percent stock close 63.59 your your thoughts on the valuation? Uh, it seems a bit high. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit high. Uh, are you are you not convinced by the AI? Craze? I I I think it's what, what 120 times earnings and and uh, fif, uh, I think it's revenues are two and a half billion and went out at a 60 billion dollar valuation. And 25 percent of its revenues come from China. Yeah, so so 25 20 almost 25 times revenues seems a little steep, but what do I know? Are you going to short it? Uh, well, you can't yet, so uh, it, it's a limited float. And uh, uh, but I'm sure at some point we'll uh, we'll crack open the prospectus. Have you been thinking about shorting Nvidia? No. 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 Don't no. get in the way of the. We have we have things that are that are perceived as AI plays that are that are trading much more expensive than Nvidia does. Hmm. So uh, I, so no need to go after the OG. We were talking before we went to break about the era of AI. Uh, what kind of opportunities has this opened up as someone who looks at the market with a very critical eye? Well, I think anytime we see one of these, these tectonic shifts in new technology, like the internet in the 90s, people uh, at first embrace everything. Everything is going to benefit. Um, but what you find out, of course, is that when it's truly, truly a, a, a major shift, is that those technologies end up harming as many businesses as they create. Mm. And so if you think about the companies that were in the business of, of distributing analog physical products that became digitized, uh, they went away. You know, Blockbuster Video, Eastman Kodak, I mean, companies like that, record stores. I mean, and, and I suspect that if AI is as big as most people think it will be, you will see lots of businesses that had moats find out that the moats have been breached. So your software as a service, what prevents a corporation from having AI design its own software hmm. for various different applications, right? And, and, and the, there's lots of things that, that suddenly you don't think about. I, the, I, I, I kind of joked a little bit a few months ago when IBM's CEO came out and said that, uh, that AI may, might, may make some of the IBM workforce redundant. And I joked, well, what happens when the clients find it, uh, that same thing out? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about your, your strategy around shorting and, mm -hmm. and what you're seeing in the market today. I, I think a lot of people, of course, understand your history with uh, being a fraud hunter and, and going after companies like Enron in the past. I'm, I'm wondering if over the last few decades with regulatory changes, you've seen fraud reduced or are there increased instances of potential fraud out there? I, I've called this the golden age of fraud. I think there's more fraud in the financial markets now than there has ever been. Um, and, Why? And I teach a course on, uh, on the history of financial market fraud. So, so uh, the cycles go back to the late 17th century. I think that, that it, it always changes, but what, what really has me bothered now is that a lot of it hides in plain sight in the way in which companies report their business and their metrics. Um, so it, it, prior to, to, say, 10 years ago, um, you really had to, to sort of, if a company was making unusual changes to its earnings statements, you know, they would have to explain it away. And nowadays, adjusted earnings are basically the norm. <laughs> and companies add back all kinds of things that they don't, don't 
Willie it is a little Ger- wild. Ger- expense. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, Coinbase, uh, in the fourth quarter of last year, I think share base comp was almost 80% of revenues. And they just added it back. I mean, and, and so it's, yeah. It's, we go back to the WeWork, why WeWork didn't go public the first time. Yeah. Community adjusted to, EBITDA. EBITDA. Yeah, it's, that was. At this point, it's a joke, but then it wasn't a joke. I know, and investors lost a lot of money. And, and the SEC, you know, promised kind of a crackdown on this a number of years ago. They, they admonished companies, as I recall, to, to not lead with these kinds of, of uh, results. But I mean, you know, for God's sakes, General Electric in the first quarter had 16 pages of adjustments on its earnings release. I mean, it, 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 it's really, you know, and companies that just take restructuring charges annually, every year they take a restructuring charge. Well, if you take it every year, it's, it's recurring. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think that, that in Silicon Valley is in particular, you know, pretty bad at this, um, where companies that lose hundreds of millions of dollars every quarter are reporting, you know, break even adjusted profits. And uh, so you just wonder if they're really businesses or are they executive enrichment schemes? Question mark for you. You know, although this is the golden age of fraud, activist activity has dropped by 85% since it hit a peak in 2015. These are numbers from direct market intelligence. Yeah, it answered the question I posed just before the break. I mean, is the era of the short seller behind us? <laughs> I think everybody asks that during every bull market. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, 1999 and early 2000, it was the same sort of question. You know, will short selling ever work? And it's sort of the corollary, does value investing ever work again? You know, when people pay higher and higher prices for, for questionable corporate assets. And the question is, is yeah, generally, yeah, it, 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 it comes back. And, and, uh, and businesses generally find their, their true value over time. I mean, just look at the meme stock, you know, run mm. up and, and now disaster uh, from 2021 to today. And, and there was no price too high to pay for some of these stocks because right. they had a short position. And ultimately, most of them have, have come crashing down to earth. We'll get back to that that specific one in a second. But uh, first, I want to ask about um, the, I guess, rising short seller in the market right now, Nate Anderson at Hindenburg. He's been big bets against Adani, um, or rather, he's said very public negative things about Adani, Icon Enterprises. You know, on, uh, do you do you see eye to eye with some of the calls that he's made? Uh, look, I think uh, the Nate and Hindenburg have done great work on a number of names, Nicola and, and others, and uh, you'd, uh, you'd be wise to at least hear what they have to say, even if you don't agree with it. Um, if it's well-researched and, and like anything, you know, s- stock prices um, are, are opinions based on facts. And, and so at the end of the day, it's essential for a marketplace, whether they're, they're positive facts or negative facts. And if you're a good investor, you know, it behooves you to, to, to basically hear both sides of any story. We'd be remiss if I didn't ask for an update from you on Tesla. Shares up 124 <laughs> percent this year. Yeah, uh, we are uh, we are short Tesla. We remain short. Uh, it's one of our one of our 44 positions that we have. Um, look, it, Tesla is is in many ways, I think, epitomizes this bull market. It's a hopes and dreams stock. Um, it's trading at 75 times earnings, which aren't growing anymore. Um, it, it looks like revenues are going to be challenged in terms of growth. So it, it's now, again, an AI story or a robo-taxi story or a battery story or a robotics story. It's, it's whatever you want it to be. And it reminds me a lot of Cisco back in 1999 and 2000, wow. where Cisco was a networking company. Tesla is a car company. But Cisco was going to get into everything else uh, that had anything to do with the Internet. And people put a higher and higher multiple on it. And ultimately, Cisco did okay, but the stock price you know, dropped 90%. I'm going to do a quick lightning round of some stuff we that has been reported that you are have, are or have been short recently. Just have me yes or no if uh, if you're still short. <laughs> <laughs> Digital Realty Trust. Uh, we are short the data centers. As SL Green Realty. Uh, SL Green is uh, we are short commercial real, real estate. estate. Okay. <laughs> Tesla, you said Sunrun. You you said uh, the uh, the. Uh, Solar leasing uh, companies, I've called them uh, science projects. They're, they're absolutely hysterical. They lose hundreds of millions of dollars, huge negative free cash flow. And getting back to our early conversation about metrics, they report 
rather than, than a regular P&L, which would be embarrassing, they report these net present value calculations based on the, the panels they put up on people's roofs. And it's absolutely hilarious the way they do it. And uh, I think investors are going to you know, find out the hard way about it. All right, Jim, we're going to spend the last 40 seconds with you getting your thoughts on what you're watching, what you're streaming, what you're doing, and uh, what you're seeing at the movie theater. New movie out, Dumb Money. <laughs> it's got Pete Davidson in it. It's got Seth Rogen in it. Uh, are you going to see it? Have you seen it? It's all about meme stocks. I, uh, I, I, I told one of your colleagues earlier, I, I don't see the need since I, I, live, uh, I live Dumb Money five days a week um, <laughs> in, in the marketplace. So uh, at some point, I'm sure I'll see it. I, I you know, I... I think it celebrates the the meme stock investors winning over uh, you know Wall Street and the and and the evil hedge funds. The sad thing is is that most of those meme stock investors have lost large amounts of money you know chasing these ideas because as we pointed out uh, a lot of these companies came crashing down to earth uh, and and in some cases have already gone bankrupt.